with two with two two speakers here. Um, basically, Professor John Bortelli and uh, Professor Karma Borch. Um, I would like to remind you first that we are going to be recording this session. So if anybody is <laughs> is uncomfortable, I guess now is the time to to let us know. So we are assuming that unless somebody says they don't want to be recorded, um, we're going to record a session. Okay. Um, if you can bear with me, I'm going to try and um, share my share my screen. So um, this is um, the first session in, uh, in, in three workshops, which are going essentially to be anchored by uh, Professor John Portelli. And if we have to look at how we're going to run with this, assuming, keeping our fingers crossed, those of us who spend our days in front of Zoom from morning to evening, that two of our colleagues do manage to, to connect with us. Um, I, will, I will spend not more than a couple of minutes um, setting, scene setting, I guess, uh, as to where this workshop fits within some of the work we've been doing. Um, I will then ask um, John to set the scene. And then <laughs> the plan is and remains that we'll then start the panel, uh, the panel presentations. So it could well be that while people are trying to connect, that John will go first, um, followed by um, followed by by Carmel. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do right at the very and then then I think the order should be there for you know, opening remarks, scene setting, panel discussions. There's time for Q and A. You can get hold of us at any time. My colleague Gabriella will be monitoring. Um, both what's happening on the Q&A and, and the chat box. There will be some closing remarks and we'll all move on. Um, I think there's a good opportunity since this is a, a workshop being co-organized between us, the, the TreeCL Foundation and the Commonwealth of Learning, our, our, our colleagues um, and friends in, in Vancouver. But you kind of vaguely see where these kind of things that we've been doing now for for quite a few years actually probably about two years how we collaborate with with coal and where this fits in within the general taxonomy of what the tree cl foundation does i mean essentially we're we're involved we're an edtech foundation so we're in the business of research edtech research we're in the business of training we're also in the business of running things so it is not just um a consulting shop or a talk shop. There are many times that we're engaged as consultants or actually to actually run projects. So if you're looking at call over here, with call, we're really interested in bridging between this huge network called the Commonwealth and the EU on the other side. And because we happen to be based in, in Malta, there's a fantastic opportunity for us to operate as a bridge between these two giant networks, I guess. Um, we collaborate uh, regularly with Col and the ILO, and we have a particular interest in, in Africa and developing countries in Africa. Uh, with the EU, I guess most of our expertise has been around um, the blockchain, blockchain services infrastructure, putting the blockchain to good public use. So that's this kind of area. I think in terms of research, we're involved in some Horizon 2020 projects, again, looking at the impact of emerging technologies on the future of education. And when it comes to training and webinars, this is what we're doing right now. So if we had to look at where this particular webinar fits in, um, it's a subject which is very close to our hearts, social justice in education. It's also part of the work that we're doing with capacity building, operating as we do at the moment from a micro state, from a small state, the smallest nation state in the, in the EU. Clearly, we have a particular interest in what happens in small states. And again, with the Commonwealth of Learning, this is an area of common interest to us. And the digital literacies and open education are really part of our DNA. So that's really what, what the Tree CL does and how this particular webinar fits in into our, our overall strategy. I think from this point onwards, what I'd like to do is hand over to, to our chair, who is Professor John Portelli, 
and who is also a professor emeritus at uh, the University of Toronto. So I can stop sharing this one and over to you, John. Thank you, Alex. And um, I uh, welcome all the people who are listening as well as the participants. Um, um, the uh, aim of these uh, three, uh, hold on, I need to get, the aim of these three webinars, we have a series of webinars starting with the first one today, is to create a meaningful conversation among international scholars and activists in education, with, as Alex has identified, a focus on social justice and education and its implications given our present context for education post COVID-19, but particularly with reference to the African continent and the, and the Middle East. Um, the participants, namely Professor George Day from the University of Toronto, a colleague of mine, uh, Professor Awad Ibrahim from the University of Ottawa, and another good colleague of mine, Professor Carmel Borch from the University of Malta. All I know from their works adhere to a robust understanding of social justice education, very much in line with um, uh, theoretical frameworks uh, associated with critical pedagogy, anti-oppressive education, and decolonial and anti-colonial educational perspectives. Um, the focus of today's webinars is social justice education reconsidered. Why do we need to reconsider social justice education? Unfortunately, um, the term social justice has now become a slogan. 30 years ago, critical pedagogues struggled to bring in the understanding of social justice into education, especially through the work, for example, of Paulo Freire, Cornel West, and Bell Hooks, and other scholars. Today, no one would dare, either from governments or universities or other educational institutions, to claim that social justice education is not important. However, unfortunately, the term and understanding of social justice has been hijacked, and I purposely use the word hijacked, by mainstream educators and policymakers who are very much influenced by neoliberalism and neoconservatism. It is not the case that anything we wish counts as social justice education. There are criteria that need to be fulfilled. My colleagues who will be um, sharing their thoughts and reflecting soon adhere to a robust understanding of social justice. And what we are considering is the following. Given that social justice and social justice education are not a frill, but they are central to education, from their perspectives and from their contexts, including contexts where they have worked, the Mediterranean, North America, the African continent, and the Middle East, what do they mean by social justice education? And what considerations need to be taken into account for teaching, especially now teaching online, from a social justice education perspective, given what we have been living as a result of COVID in the last 16, 17 months. There have been positive developments. There have been new challenges. How may we resolve these challenges? What support may be needed? And so on and so forth. So this is the context 
for the series of these seminars and for today, the focus is on reconsiderations of social justice education. Our first speaker is uh, Professor George Day. Hi, George. And um, Professor Day is a professor of social justice education and the director of the Center for Integrative Anti-Racism Studies at the Ontario Institute for Studies Education of the University of Toronto. Um, Professor Day's name has been for a long time associated with integrative anti-racism, about which he has written scores of articles and books. Professor Day is the 2015, 2016, 2018, and 19 Carnegie African Diasporan Fellow. In June of 2007, Professor Day was installed as a traditional chief in Ghana, his original homeland, specifically as the Gaya Shehene of the town of Asakore, Koforidwa, in the new Yawaben traditional area of Ghana. His school name is Nana Adusei Sefa Tweneboa. George, the floor is yours. You have about 20 minutes. And once you have three minutes, I will remind you again. Thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Day. The floor is yours. Yeah, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to share a screen and see. Yeah. Let me know if everything is, you see everything. Am I, am I on? Okay, good. So um, thank you, um, John. And, and um, first of all, um, I'm, I'm going to be speaking from where I am at uh, in terms of what I'm, uh, in terms of Toronto and Ontario and Canada uh, and bring up some of these issues. Uh, but I also want to just um, recognize um, the land on which we are and why the elders and the ancestors into this room. I think for me, the teachings of the land are what's very, very important and the responsibility that come with that. Uh, I also want to thank the 3CL Foundation for inviting me and to be on this session with uh, my colleagues, John, uh, Kamel, and Awad. Um, so I'm just going to uh, just run through a couple of things and then hopefully when it comes to discussion, we could get into, into this uh, more in-depth analysis of what I'm saying. Uh, in Africa, it is uh, often said that when the student is ready, the teacher will always be there. However, in North America, it becomes a saying that when the teacher is ready, the students will come. Um, I think for me, I come at this knowing that our world is fast changing. And it's very, very clear the way you see what is going on now that some stand the risk of being fossilized. Like we stand the risk of being stuck in the past because of what. And I'm here talking about the current mobilizations around white grievances. You see it in restricting voting rights in the US, uh, the way conservatives in Britain, for example, are misinterpreting critiques of white privilege uh, as actually accounting for working class neglect, uh, working class education neglect, rather than look at this, the long standing systemic underfunding uh, of education uh, as the contributing factor. You also see it as a part of that stoking the war between race and class it's other resource class rather than see them as they go hand in hand. And particularly the vicious backlash to race education. Um, one of the things that struck me, for example, is how um, the very people who cry cancel culture, are the very people who want to cancel out critical race theory. Right? And, and so this culture was in many ways, some of very, very um, strong and steadfast against some of us in terms of our interest for things of racial justice. I, I think the question needs to be asked, for example, who would have thought that in, the, in an age of global pandemic, right, the greatest threat to Western liberal democracies would just see at critical race theory. Right? And I say this because you see in the US context, there's this populist rhetoric that has ensured that CRT has become a lightning rod 
for white conservatives. You see it in the vicious backlash in anti-racist education in Florida, in Texas, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma, Idaho, where um, GOP lawmakers have passed bills to prohibit the teaching of critical race theory in schools, colleges, and universities. And why are they doing that? Uh, they come out with this flimsy and very pathetic uh, uh, reason that CRT somehow indoctrinates young learners. It poses a threat to the American way of life. It exacerbates and influences divisions rather than creating inter-ethnic group, as Amalek talks about. Nothing is further from, from the truth. Right? And, and this is very, very important because we talk about when the US sneezes. Uh, for me, Canada catches cold, but it's not just Canada, it's the global, the global community. Uh, we all catch cold from that. And it's very, very important to see what's happening there as very, very relevant to our conversations. So I start with the question because we were given some questions to respond to, and, and I'm, I'm presenting along those questions. The whole question is about reframing social justice education. And I think to me, education should be for human liberation. It's not just the equity, diversity, and inclusion. It's education for, for human liberation. And I think what we see here is that continued normalization of white and dominant racial frames in schooling and education. That has been very damaging to all learners. Right? There still continues to be this fixation on an add on approach where the school curriculum remains intact with no disruption of colonial oppressive and exclusionary structures of schooling and education. I think if you want to interrupt this, if you want to subvert this, we need to get into abolitionist politics. And one of the abolitionist politics is basically to, to move away from this liberal understanding of inclusion and rather to talk about inclusion as beginning anew. You break down, you dismantle, and you, be, you, you build anew. Uh, and that's how I'm coming at it in terms of the work of social justice. I think global leadership in this regard, all right, uh, when we talk about standards and resources, must address systemic issues of power, whiteness, and white supremacy. It has to address that. It also must lead to empowering learners to confront anti-blackness, anti-black racism, anti-indigenous racism, anti-Asian racism, and so forth. And the educational violence that marks itself in the erasures, the omissions, and negations of people's histories, their knowledges, and their experiences. And in many ways, create this binary or this false separation between the family, the community, and the school. Right? And we need to break that as a meaningful way of sharing power. Social justice education also has to embrace the question of decolonization and indigeneity in order to dismantle, disrupt colonial structures of schooling, including its colonial hierarchies in that regard. So I want to focus this on, as one of the questions was, what do we need to look at? Or what are the issues when it comes to teaching online from a social justice perspective? I think we know that COVID-19, right, has added to schooling challenges in a climate of reduced resources, inequities in online technology, shift in schooling demographics, who are the bodies who are in schools, and the urgency of centering these questions of race, equity, and justice. Right? I think here the point is that race and equity have implications for remote learning. For example, access to civil internet, computer access, meeting the needs of the most vulnerable students. We also see it in terms of reduced access to material resources, inadequate academic support that impacts on student learning outcomes. And the fear here is it is likely to exacerbate the achievement gaps between children from lower socioeconomic class and those from the upper uh, or higher socioeconomic class, or those from higher income learning ports, as people like Bas Karmati and Afonso recently talked about. There's also the problem of increased absenteeism from online classes with no conscious or strategic effort to offset such absences. There's also that potential of increased failure rates because of the lack of personalized learning or lessons to meet the learning needs of our students. And this, my fear is, could lead to a further personalization, how we pathologize Black, African, Indigenous, and racialized learners. Then there's the issue around the great mental health concerns. 
how, for example, anti-Black racism in this context becomes an additional mental health stressor on top of questions about social distancing and dealing with COVID-19. There are the physical and mental health stress of learning to navigate even technology, online technology, and to stay focused and attached to the screen. Some of us have even Zoom bump in terms of this being staying on the screen for that too long. And a continued emotional trauma of isolation, a feeling of deprivation and inadequacy. The question becomes, how do we engage students online? How to assess learners through self-directed learning? And that in itself is a lot of work for any child, let alone children who are facing other social pressures. Even the whole issue of planning virtual learning brings intense burden on parents. But we are those uh, students whose parents come from uh, or who work in precarious jobs, such as what we call our essential workers. Or students who, uh, even when, if they went to school, they are at a risk of parents not being there or parents having to work over time. Teachers are also largely preoccupied with learning how to use Zoom and Google, classroom, right space. The whole issue around learning how to navigate online courses, online course delivery, ill-equipped teachers who are ill-equipped to handle class sizes, large class sizes, and learning levels in these classes. Then, of course, there's that historic problem of lack of curricular sophistication and here the culturally relevant responsive pedagogy for student engagement. And these are all compounded when we have this learning, virtual learning, learning on Zoom, uh, learning um, through online platforms. And the problem is that some of these online platform models are outdated, they're very, very outdated, and they are based on white hegemonic context. So deconstructing the normal, it was one question that we were asked to look at. I think we need to be very, very critical of what we call the normal for its take on oppression and exclusion. And I'm here talking about things of class, gender, sexuality, and so forth. Some of us bring a deep skepticism to the supposedly new normal because there are still the long-standing issues of racial, gender, class, sexual, and indigenous inequities that still persist. And they are only exacerbated by the new emerging challenges of the so-called new normal. Those who have power are those who are invoking this new normal, as if that normal was not in contention in the first place. The normal itself was in contention. So you cannot invoke a, somewhat, a new normal and presume that somehow it will not be in contention. It was in contention because issues around anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism still persist. And they are not what should be normal in our settings. So we ask, for example, was white supremacy normal? Where pervasive surveillance and policing of black, indigenous, and racialized people normal? I think this is a point that many of us also make that sometimes we talk about COVID 19. It has eyes, it sees, and it has been able to seize on existing inequities of race, class, gender, class, sexuality, disability and indignity of the so-called normal and the new normal. Who benefits when we are excluded or when we talk about this teaching online? I think the question of how we see race in online teaching and also how online teaching itself works with race is very, very important as others have talked about. Online teaching practices continue to center and anticipate white learners, white experiences, and white epistemologies. In other words, there's the ontological whiteness of how we come to understand educational success in the first place. There's also the question of whose voices matter. We know that the voices of dominant parents are usually heard the most, even before. COVID-19, even before online. Black and indigenous racialized exclusions 
as I mentioned earlier, still persists in terms of the lack of access to technology. Schools don't guarantee the provision of electronic devices, for example, Wi-Fi access and capability, even though, for example, where I sit in Toronto, as Robin Minard recently uh, wrote, right, in Toronto, a 20, 2012 data from the Toronto District School Board found that 48% of Black children lived in families with incomes which are less than $30,000 a year, compared to 9% of white children. This is a rate which is five times higher, and I think so problematic. Even government funding through, for example, in Ontario, through Ontario Support for Learners Program, that is supposed to offset some of these hardships with a one-time payment of $200 for students who are under age, right? Who are under the age of 18 and $250 for students who are above 18 and with disability may not be enough. It's not enough to deal with the challenges. Professor Day, sorry to interrupt you. Um, you have about five minutes left. Thank you. Within the Toronto District School Board, schools with the highest level of opportunities index have access to grocery cards, which is they have access to extra support for families through designated support workers. This is helpful, but again, this needs to be expanded to offer to other school board jurisdictions with greater concentration of black, racialized, working class background students. So going forward, some recommendations to resolve the educational challenges. As I said, COVID-19 has compounded problems of racism. And what the pandemic, if there's, if there's any lesson at all, it has to compel us to reimagine schooling and education. And to what my colleague, Carl James says, to re-examine institutional policies, programs, practices that have been sustained in ways that are very untenable for Black, Indigenous, and racialized students. We also need to examine new modalities and methodologies of teaching. Educators, as part of their regular practice, have to look for equity-based patterns in our world and how this allows us to reflect and adapt our teaching. We also have to address the contraction of the school curriculum in terms of the breadth and depth of teaching styles and making online teaching more humane to address access and equity issues in technology, the global, national, and regional disparities that are very, very clear in modern technology. We also need to think about providing resources that will actually achieve socially just teaching and learning and respond to the rising online digital hate. Part of online is also about the rising hate. People hide under online to produce hate and to see how online platforms can work with different models and come with multiple strategies for accessing students to different teaching modalities. I, I, I think to me, the whole issue of refusing coloniality is very important. And we can only refuse coloniality when we ask the question, what is education for? What schools do we want and are willing to fight for? That should be a fundamental question of social justice. What is education for? What is education for? What schools do we want? And this will entail that we work with a new grammar of Black, Indigenous, racialized rhetoric where we reclaim the past and learn from the lessons, we reflect on the present and are able to project onto the future with a Ferrarian, a Polyferrarian sense of hope and possibilities that would say there's a possibility of another possible. Thank you very much, Asante Hassan. Thank you very much, George. Um, you have reminded us of the big question, education for what? Schooling for what? Of course, schooling and education are not identical. You have reminded us of several challenges that we need to consider. And you also boldly 
identified specific recommendations. And of course, the generic phrase you ended up with, um, possibility of hope for new possibilities and new possibilities, hopefully, which will be more robustly socially just. Thank you very much. Um, we will move on. Our second uh, participant is Professor Awad Ibrahim um, from the University of Ottawa. Um, hello, Awad, and welcome. Awad, Awad Ibrahim at the moment um, is uh, in UAE. He is, however, um, another colleague of mine, a full professor at the Faculty of Education at the University of, of Ottawa. He is primarily a curriculum theorist and a sociologist of education with special interest in the economy of hospitality, cultural studies, an expert on hip hop and youth and black popular culture and social justice and community service learning. And uh, more recently, his work on diasporic and continental African identities, where he has done several studies. He has researched and published widely in all of these areas. Um, internationally, he has ongoing projects in Canada and the United States, but also in Morocco, in Sudan, and now also in the Middle East. I know from firsthand that, um, um, well, before I say my last point about Awad, his two recent books are Black Immigrants in North America, a collection of essays on race and hip hop and language and identity and politics. And also another book of his recent one entitled In This Together, Blackness, Indigeneity and Hip Hop. Um, Professor Awad Ibrahim continues to work with patients with schools. He actually goes to schools and teaches also with while doing research. And he is known for high school students as Dr. Dri. Dr. Dri, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate this. Uh, I'm going to share my uh, screen and uh, so that you can uh, see where, where I'm at. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, George. Uh, 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 thank you, Carmel. Thank you, uh, Malta, for uh, uh, offering this opportunity. I know we have uh, very limited time, about 15 minutes, so I'm going to go right to it. Uh, I titled my talk, uh, The Praxis of um, social justice education, uh, a language reconsidered. And I have two items that I really, really would love to share with you. Um, following George's, uh, what I think George had offered us is a kind of a framework. Uh, and so I'm gonna go a little bit, uh, if George went horizontal, I wanna go vertical in few points uh, and offer what I would call as basic principles of social justice education. And this is just for a way for all of us to think about and trigger discussion more than uh, offering uh, Solomonic wisdom and once and for all resolve all the, uh, all the world's problem. And I also wanna tell a story of a high school that uh, John just mentioned uh, that I work with and as a way for me to ground my, not only to ground my work, but to ground what I think about when I see, when I'm, when I'm talking about social justice uh, education. So those are the two agendas that I, or two items in my agenda that I, I would love to share with you. Um, before anything, and I think George had offered us a brilliant way to think about uh, these difficult issues. Um, for us to understand the social justice uh, education and, and as a language to, re, to, uh, to be reconsidered, 
we really, really need to, to debunk uh, what George would, uh, would agree with me on the dichotomy between theory and practice. Um, and think ab about ourselves as teachers, particularly uh, 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 um, uh, uh, elementary, middle school and high school teachers, think about ourselves as intellectual workers, uh, because that's what we do, we do intellectual work. So um, here I'm just gonna refer back to uh, the Ferrarian uh, notion of praxis, but I also wanna push that idea a little bit further by introducing uh, Walter Maniello's uh, notion of border thinking. And, I, and this is where uh, I, 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 I really want us to start from this point, this idea of border thinking. And here, um, and I don't know, uh, we, can, we can pick up this in the discussion later, it is it's not, it's not so easy to resolve and solve the tension between an outsider and, outs uh, and inside and outside, uh, colonial and decolonial. Uh, so the border thinking is realizing the urgency of the moment, realizing this is a historical moment that we really, really need to think about what it actually, how is the colonial impacting the decolonial? How is the inside impacting the outside? And, and so how is the South impacting the, the North and how is the North impacting the South? And this is what I'm calling, I'm borrowing from Mignolo's uh, uh, idea of border thinking. And I really want to, want us, when we think about social justice, I want us to start here. This idea of border thinking, which is a kind of in conjunction with a uh, uh, Ferrarian notion of praxis. But I also, and this is the second point, I, I want us to uh, realize that diversity is not difference. Um, precisely because diversity uh, you know, it works with a kind of, a, I would qualify as a banal notion of um, containment. Uh, so we are all different. Um, so we are all, there's, there's this notion that if you go deeper, we have multiple uh, uh, differences and so on and so forth. And, and so in that sense, diversity becomes kind of a, a kind of a, a salad that has everything. And, and I don't think that's a very helpful as a framework when we think about social justice. So instead, uh, I'm gonna go back to Homi Baba's notion of difference, uh, which is uh, uh, going a little bit deeper than just we're all kind of uh, different in some shape or form. Um, I also want us, want us, when we think about social justice, to think about us as teachers. Uh, because it's very easy to say, oh, I'm taking this workshop so that I can go out and teach, uh, you know, this, this unit uh, on, you know, uh, on Africa or Asia or whatever, whatever it might be. Uh, I, I don't think that's a very helpful framework when we think about social justice. I want us to start with ourselves, because if we're not good to ourselves as teachers, we're not good to anybody. And if we're not centered as individuals, we're not good to anybody. Uh, so uh, social justice is, is, is the starting point of social justice is the individual teachers. And, and that is our entrance. Really, I wanna repeat this again. That is our entrance to social justice work is the transformation of, of, of the self as it, work, uh, as it works itself out into the, uh, the world and, and as it interacts with um, uh, other entities and other beings. Um, so that's a really, those are the three points that I want us to always think about as, as, I, as I progress into my, uh, into my work or into my presentation. And John just mentioned the tension between education and schooling, and that is, for me, a trigger to a whole lot of work that is not being done thoroughly. I consider schooling as the, the four walls that we call the school and education. A lot of our education happens in schools, but most of our education happens outside the school. And I won't have the time. Um, I, I was planning to show you this video. So I'm gonna show you just a segment of it and then move on just to break the uh the silence and so you want 
to get a degree. Why? Let me tell you what society will tell you. It increases your chances of getting a job, provides you with an opportunity to be successful. Your life will be a lot less stressful. Education is the key. Now, let me tell you what your parents will tell you. Make me proud. It increases your chances of getting a job, provides you with an opportunity to be successful. Your life will be a lot less stressful. Education is the key. Now, let's look at the statistics. Steve Jobs, net worth, 7 billion, RIP. Richard Branson, net worth, 4.2 billion. Oprah Winfrey, net worth $2.7 billion. Mark Zuckerberg, Henry Ford, Steven Spielberg, Bill Gates. Now here comes the coup de grace. Looking at these individuals, what's your conclusion? Neither of them, in being successful, ever graduated from a higher learning institution. And, and I think that's, that's, that is a trigger. That is something for us, to, for all of us to think about as we, as we do uh, social justice. Before we think about social justice, I want to just kind of very briefly offer uh, what, I, what, I, what I see as a, as a historical or trajectory uh, 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 segue into social justice. Before social justice, and some of it is still reminiscence and still on the work. Uh, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, the three um, kind of epistemologies that preceded social justice, at, lo at least to my, to my reading of the history of social justice, uh, is the assimilationist approach, integrationist approach, and the cultural pluralist uh, approach. And, and uh, what, is, what makes these three approaches really interesting is they all work within a diversity framework. And, and so, and instead, what I want to do is I move. I, I want to move on to the approach that I that that we're considering right here. Um, uh, that is the social justice. It comes under different names and different titles. Um, uh, Stephen May would call it critical multiculturalism. George Day would call it anti-racism. John Portelli would call it equity. Uh, uh, Tara Goldstein would call it inclusivity. Um, Giroux would call it critical and radical pedagogy. Uh, uh, Carole Fleury, Fleury uh, would call it uh, interculturalism, and so on and so forth. So all of these Professor names... Awad, yes. sorry to interrupt you. Uh, five minutes, more or less. Thank you. Sorry. So, uh, so what, what do we mean by social justice? It's clearly an action-oriented framework, um, and it works with a systemic uh, framework uh, the changing or, or um, uh, institutional and, and systemic change more than anything else. Um, so this is where it becomes really interesting. And I want to offer this as a way to think about this historical moment in which we live. The fence that is that you're seeing before you right now is what I what I would uh, what I would like us to think about as the COVID-19, and what COVID-19 did. Uh, as we as we look at this picture, is it made naked uh, the reality that is that, that was not clear to a lot of people, and the reality is equality is not equity, and you could see it in the fence that equality is uh, uh, treating all people the same way, and and uh, this is will be equality. The equity is uh, uh, kind of treating people and relating to people based on their needs and. Um, and uh, ultimately, what we want to uh, reach is the last uh, point of uh, liberation, uh, however we define that. So let me get right to, uh, because of time, what I consider as uh, 16 principles of uh, social justice. Uh, first of all, uh, when, we, when we refer to categories of difference, we're not simply referring to race, class, gender, sexuality, and so on, but we also want to include religion, uh, culture and, and all the rest of it. When we think about social justice, we also want to think about intersectionality and that, that we can pick up in the discussion later on. I really want to introduce social justice as a basic education. It's, how, it's a, literally, it's about how to read and write and how to express ourselves in ways that others would sit down and hear us uh, in so many different ways. It's for all students and not just for minority students. Uh, and in fact, um, social justice is, is more about the dominant, as George just mentioned, 
than the dominating. And always uh, doesn't need any explanation. Everybody knows that teaching is a political act. However, uh, social justice always begins with a deconstruction and the realization of the impact of the st status quo as we live it right now. And George, had, George Day had done a fantastic job uh, around that, questioning the male power uh, privilege. Uh, uh, number eight will be uh, continued questioning the continued marginalization of certain voices. Uh, George Day already talked about that. Um, nine is creating spaces for the historical marginalized voices and talk about the silence. And this is the key term in social justice, the leftover. Let's talk about the leftover, the things that we uh, over and over again, we, we tend to uh, leave out. However, as we include multiple voices, that should not simply meaning, uh, should not uh, automatically mean that we are excluding uh, uh, the canons. It's not about reading uh, whether to read Shakespeare or not. It is about how do we read Shakespeare? And that is where social justice starts. Uh, it, uh, social justice permeates everything. It's not a unit as, uh, as, as we all know. It's a holistic approach in this sense that it links, uh, it goes back to what George Day would call the health, uh, just, just presented as the, as the health and wellness of being. Uh, that is the link between the body and the mind. And ultimately a uh, question of identity, the parent and the parental involvement in this sense, uh, uh, and, and also how do we teach and what we teach. And, and, uh, and ultimately social justice, uh, as we all know, it's a, a never ending process. In other words, no one get up in the morning and, and rub their bellies and say, I am so social justice today. In other words, I'm done. Um, so it's an ongoing uh, process. Really, to just uh, recap really, really quickly, I went to a high school in 2007, I arrived at the University of Ottawa. And as I arrived, uh, there we are, the center in downtown uh, Ottawa, and we have no connection with the urban schools, uh, the, the schools around, around us in downtown Ottawa. So um, I, I realize I'm not gonna wait for someone else to start something. So um, that's, that's, what I'm, that's point one. Lesson number one that from my experience is do not wait for others to start something. If you see something that needs to be done, go for it. Um, so I went to a high school where uh, a very high concentration of uh, African immigrant uh, uh, students and I made a link between the faculty and uh, that school. Um, that link uh, led to students from the high school visiting the universities but also my university students uh, are visiting, um, go to a high school uh, as, go, go to the high school as well. Um, and not only that, but uh, I even conducted my classes at the high, at the high school, um, um, uh, at the high school. So in this sense, uh, this is a way for us to think about uh, just a possibility of how social justice um, uh, work might, might, might start. I can give you more details in the, uh, in the discussion. Uh, I was planning to show you one of the videos of the students who um, uh, was, was at the high school and then moved to California, uh, but I don't think there is enough time, unless, George, unless uh, John permits me to show the Awad, video. Thank you very much. Um, I wish we had more time. However, oh. however, oh. however, we may organize a follow-up to this one as well in the near future, okay? So that is also a possibility that we have spoken uh, within the 3 cl and with Cole, all right? Okay. So thank you very much, Awad. Um, very clear. Um, you are telling us, go to the roots. You are reminding us what the roots are, making links with what George said earlier, and do it which is very important, not just talk about it and do it. And this is why the importance of your story and other stories of yours, I know, that you mentioned at the end. But you were also reminding us to start from the moment. This is the COVID-19 moment. It is a moment 
we have to learn from. Although there are challenges, there are also possibilities, and we need to deconstruct, as you remind us, by bringing forth the notion of the border thinking and the different um, distinctions that you, you very clearly identified to us. And finally, starting from us as teachers. And the process is ongoing, it never ends. And of course, the importance of intersectionality and involvement of parents, this is what all basic education is all about, going to the roots and do it. Thank you, Awad. We move now to the third and final participant, um, Professor Carmel Borg from the Department of Arts, Open Communities and Adult Education in the Faculty of Education at the University of uh, Malta. Allow me to, I need to bring up a document, sorry. Here it is. Um, Carmel, another good colleague of mine, and thank you again to Carmel um, for accepting to be on this panel. He is the head of the department and a former dean of the Faculty of Education, um, an educator, an academic, a researcher, creative writer, Carmel also writes poetry and children's um, picture books. And he is a public intellectual here in Malta, without any doubt. Uh, he lectures and publishes on the intersectionality of social justice and education as hope and possibility. And he is also the editor of the Malta Review of Educational Research and of the Educational Research Monograph Series. I have known Carmel since he was a doctoral student at OISI, where uh, both Professor Awad and where George and I currently teach. And this takes us back to the early 1990s. Carmel, with pleasure, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I should like to thank for also um, George and Awad for providing me with the, you know, um, a very solid uh, platform uh, backdrop to my uh, presentation. Um, in response to Awad's um, uh, reference to uh, the concept of border thinking, I would say border thinking and border acting. I am the quintessential, the classical case of a uh, border uh, thinker and actor because I'm operating within an educational institution of higher learning, which uh, traditionally has, you know, um, reproduced uh, uh, privilege. But at the same time, I'm coming from an underprivileged uh, family who was told very early in his life that you know university is not uh, for him. So um, this is the kind of existence that obviously I live uh, on a daily basis here within the higher education institution. Um, my presentation is triggered by the fact that you know um, uh, so many um, transnational uh, organizations from EU to OECD are peddling this idea that you know the uh, that technology and digitalization is uh, the way forward that basically they will save us in the present and in the near future this is my recent research so i can safely say that in terms of policy documents there is very little critique of you know the digitalization process and the uh, use of technology as uh, mediator of uh, learning. So allow me to uh, spend these uh, next uh, 15 minutes trying to fill in some of you know, the uh, uh, lacuna left uh, by these uh, documents. Um, so uh, to uh, frame my presentation, these, is, these are basically uh, my uh, parameters. I will be focusing my presentation on uh, uh, online learning, uh, in particular network learning, where collaboration and collaborative internet-based education is uh, a key word. Uh, we will later, of course, uh, redefine and revisit this term network learning. Uh, basically, I will be focusing almost exclusively uh, on uh, higher education, so we will not speaking on education from, uh, you know, cradle to grave, but specifying, you know, higher education as an area of interest. Uh, my approach, so my location, my standpoint, which is never neutral, is uh, coming from uh, the post-colonial um, uh, perspective. So basically, I'm very much interested in rethinking agency, 
uh, in present times and also post-digital. Now post-digital after Agamben has nothing to do with you know, debunking and doing away with the digital age, but basically uh, providing space and opportunities to explore the consequences of the digital age. So basically I have two aims in this presentation, looking at the limits of uh, network learning as it is currently configured, specifically that it fails to take account of emancipatory struggles and political imperatives in society more broadly. That's the language of uh, critique. And then of course, there's the language of possibility, revisualizing a digital agenda that is genuinely uh, inclusive. So that's as far as uh, you know, uh, my intentions are concerned. Now, of course, uh, technologies and the digital world is not developing um, in a vacuum. There is obviously a political context. And let me remind you that technologies and technologies of learning and digitalization of learning took off mainly in the last quarter uh, of the uh, 20th century. This, is, this was the quarter where the Chicago boys, you know, uh, went to Chile in the Pinochet era to start uh, in concrete terms, the first experiment in neoliberalism. Also uh, in the UK, you have Thatcher claiming that there is no such thing as society, that society does not exist, that we are all individuals. You have Reagan uh, in the US. Uh, so basically, um, technologies in learning took off in an era where basically uh, there is the retreat of the state and there is the foregrounding of uh, individualism. So this reading, understanding and naming of the word contradicts, contradicts the neutral technification process oriented or methods obsessed and fetishization of interaction for its own sake. So what I'm trying to do in the remaining minutes is to try to uh, not debunk, but all, but challenge uh, the current discourse around digitalization and online uh, learning. So basically, uh, the question around social justice and online learning, social justice and digitalization, as far as the presentation is concerned, is not exactly about penetration of online. It's not about accessibility of online. These are, of course, uh, important infrastructures that we need uh, to embrace and push for further penetration. But the main question, and this has also links to awards, but also in George's you know, presentation is the question, online network learning for what? What are these connections networks for? That is the key question as far as my presentation is concerned. Now let's have a look at the normalized discourse that we find in policy documents advocating for foregrounding, pushing for the technologization and technification of education. These are some of the keywords gleaned, you know, from these policy documents: connectivity, interactivity, accessibility, exchange, bridging, border crossing, permeability. Who can quarrel with these, you know, um, normalized uh, discourses? But at the same time, the same institutions that are peddling this discourse of connectivity, of collaboration, et cetera, are the same institutions that rarely critique what they are fundamentally pushing for in terms of economy, in terms of sociality, in terms therefore of the latest chapter, which critical pedagogues would refer to as savage and predatory capitalism. And here we have two very contrasting, you know, uh, discourses coming from, you know, institutions that are peddling, you know, these two realities that I find very contrasting to each other. Capitalism, which is nothing, anything but collaborative, which is exploitative, alienating, concentrated wealth and power, mobile and global, and which regenerates itself, but also, an economic framework that is generating all these issues which are antithetical to the discourse which we found in policy documents pushing for more digitalization and more and more online in the name of connectivity, disposability, asymmetry, inequality, stratified hierarchical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have policy documents currently being written, 
advocating for connectivity, collaboration, communality with digitalization as the main network. But at the same time, as I said, these are the same institutions which are mum in terms of, you know, critically engaging with the world, which is becoming increasingly unequal, asymmetrical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what COVID did is basically not only unveiled the asymmetry and inequality created by this predatory um, economic system, but also it has precipitated inequalities. In other words, digitalization uh, foregrounding and pushed as social justice has to confront uh, this con context whereby you know, societies are increasingly becoming socially, culturally, and economically uh, more, 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 more polarized. So what's the response of social justice, education uh, to all this? And this is what I've been grappling with in action with the hundreds of students that uh, I engage with on a regular basis, on a yearly basis. So for me, social justice epistemologically means, involves critique of the world that is an action to transform it to a world that is not. It requires powerful knowledge. So this is, in essence, my understanding of social justice. This is what I keep in mind when I'm interacting not only with students uh, uh, present in higher education institutions where I teach, but also within the communities uh, where I act. So uh, this is basically epistemologically for me, this is the star which guides me as far as social justice is concerned. But epistemology needs to be transformed into pedagogy. So basically, uh, when it comes to social justice pedagogy, educators need to promote voice and experience of people not to act on their behalf or to fix them. So pedagogically, a social justice informed pedagogy is antithetical to a deficit approach at pedagogy. So it's about voice. It's about intuition. It's about experiential knowledge. It's about confirming and validating, you know, people's experiences. And when we validate people's experiences, we are generating current themes current concerns, on the ground concerns, coming straight from, okay, the very protagonists, the very participants, the very students uh, within uh, the cultural circle. So these are the two pillars, so to speak, which have always guided me over the past 30 years in terms of my approach, social justice approach to education, whether it's face-to-face -face and whether it's online. These are principles that transcend the space. So we're talking here about hopeful spaces. We are talking here about educators who are resources of hope, whether they are face-to-face, -face, whether they are, they are blended, whether they are hybrid, these are the principles that transcend and have transcended uh, my, uh, my, my, my pedagogy. So this is the context now. Okay. Armel? Yes. Sorry to interrupt. You have five minutes left. I okay, know you may okay. be finishing, but uh, like I did with the other ones. Yeah, okay, five. okay, okay, okay. So this is the space specific context uh, of higher education. And this is where essentially innocence starts to drop and uh, higher education institutions start becoming, you know, or appearing as naked, you know, as possible in front of this uh, situation. Wherever I was, you know, on committees, on boards, etc., online learning in higher education institutions was not peddled as you know a pedagogy for us to reach out genuinely and authentically to the other, but as a way of filling in the economic gap of the institution. So this is my major critique here. Most of the institutions are not genuine in embracing online learning are not authentic in their approach. They are anything but transformative and liberatory 
and emancipatory in their use of you know online instruments to reach out uh, to other you know uh, to people located uh, outside now if you look carefully on, on what is happening in terms of online learning online learning by and large this is of course stemming from my research is uh, very much intimately linked to the platform economy i don't have the time to go into further details but the platform economy is becoming increasingly increasingly okay exploitative in nature so we're talking about a space an online space which is sold as a communal space as a democratic space as an open space as an authentic space and when you look at the dynamics of online learning, you will see uh, that many people pushing or rather following this agenda as pedagogues are living precariously. How can you speak of democratic spaces, of authentically transformative spaces, of socially just spaces when people are being exploited in the process? You cannot speak of transformation when you see that online learning is a fragmentary or a fragmented experience. So most of it advocates for asynchronous learning. So you learn when you can, you learn in between. When transformation and social justice is highly dependent on presence, on communality, on real and genuine authentic collaboration and fragmentation as i see it is antithetical you know uh, to all all this i have to obviously skip all my preparation so let me conclude uh, with the fact that throughout this year with my international students who come from all over the world we were trying to build you know a manifesto for transformative education in the COVID era. So basically not only engaging critically with the world, but also imagining, visualizing a world that is not, a world that can be. So the idea is to use these democratic spaces in my courses to build uh, a, a vision. So when the course stops and finishes, these people can go into the different geographic spaces and create uh, spaces of hope and resources of hope through such an agenda. So what I've been doing throughout this year is basically taking advantage of this era, of this year to build with uh, hundreds of students a, a vision of the world uh, that can be. And that vision of the world that can be has to start intellectually before it can go on uh, to say and to do and to act uh, on the world. Thank you, um, John. Thank you, Carmel, very much. Um, exactly on time. And, um, and uh, once again, in line with um, critical pedagogy, anti-colonial, decolonial, you start with the critique, showing us the contradictions and tensions that exist between different policy discourses. And of course, of course, the tensions that these contradictions create for educators, teachers in a variety of contexts, whether it is in the university or in public, in public schools. However, you do not stop there. You show us the possibilities and very much in line of what George and Awad have recommended earlier, you talk about the importance of the critique, not just for itself, but to change, to change to a world that is not yet, but can be possible. And this, of course, is what gives us the hope to keep on going. But also people will say, how can this be done? And once again, like Awad, you ended up with a very practical example from your own context. 
where you have shown us through your own teaching what you managed to create to go beyond the boundaries and the dictates of how online learning is popularly um, in, interpreted. Of course, none of us, I believe, are saying that online learning cannot be used properly, but we are cautioning, of course, that like any other slogan, it, it, can, it can lead us to a form of activism that is blind and not notice the contradictions that it is actually creating. Let me now say a push for 3CL. Uh, for those of you who have the time, you can go to the webpage of 3CL. This is exactly one of the major missions consistent with the vision of 3CL to create networking internationally, like we are doing now, but also to create an online space that is democratically, publicly available for free. And this is exactly what we are, we are doing, okay? Um, we have about 17 minutes left. I don't think there is time to create a conversation among ourselves, although I have already been talking with Alex and others on, through, through another app, we can try to do a follow-up through this to give us more time. So let me move now to the audience the and try to create some participation. So dear audience, you can write both on the chat as well as the QA question and Gabriella is uh, kindly monitoring these two. Uh, so I will, I will be, I will be um, identifying the questions. So let me take some time. Let me give time for the audience to write comments or questions. And if you have a question, it could be of a generic kind, or it could be of of a, a specific kind to one of the of the um, participants. Okay. So let me read, let me read three or four, and then I will give chance to the panel to comment. So the first question comes from Bukola, um, and she asks, the question that pops into my mind is who or what are these leftovers practically? Who or what are these leftovers practically? I think um, it was Awad uh, who spoke about the leftovers, okay? But I think also um, by implication, they has, George has made reference to this as well as Carmelo. Um, another question is from um, Oyigoga Onu. The question is, how do you reconcile the need for social justice education and the need for distance education in today's global context. So I will repeat, um, how do you reconcile the need for social justice education and the need for distance education in today's global context? That is the second question. I will move to another one. This is a question for Professor Borch, Carmel, this is for you, but I think others can comment as well from their experiences. I know we have all been teaching online. And the question is, would you please discuss the asynchronous learning point further with regards to transformative education? So the asynchronous learning versus, I suppose, synchronous learning or the two combined uh, with regards to transformative education. I will take a fourth one, and then I will give some time to the, to the uh, panelists to comment as they see fit on the basis of these four questions. And you can freely move from one to the other one, and maybe we can also create some conversation as we do this. The last one is, um, someone is saying a follow-up would be great. These presentations were, okay. 
um, but we need to have deeper conversations. Okay, so this is um, this is a generic comment. Thank you for the comment, Punita. We will do our best to have follow-ups. Um, I think these are the questions we have at the moment. So, George, Awad, Carmel, I will start in the same order. I will start with George. Maybe I should give you about two minutes each and then come back to, to, to us as a group. George, thank you. Okay, so um, I, I, I on, the, on the question of left to waste, I think I would best um, capture that. But I think to me, right, um, I, I look at this things in terms of uh, who's the bodies who schools are not designed for, right? When we look at the, 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 um, the school system, right? They were not designed for all bodies. They were designed for particular bodies, um, the powerful, the wealthy. Um, and so when, to me, the leftovers in terms of bodies become um, bodies like racialized, uh, disadvantaged, working class, um, students, indigenous bodies, and, 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 that, and how we, we talk about schooling in a way that centers the experiences of these bodies. Uh, you can also extend it to the question of knowledge, right? Uh, that which is also in terms of the discounted knowledges, right? There are certain knowledges that have been devalued in the Foucauldian sense. They, are, they, 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 they have been discounted, right? And I think we need to talk about how we bring these knowledges. So a big part of my work is how we center indigeneity and indigenous knowledge, indigenous philosophies, in a way to decenter uh, the, the, the universality. Um, on, on the question of um, um, the distance education and online learning and uh, reconciling um, uh, or distance education and social justice education, I think to me the issue is that all the issues that we talk about, right, around questions of how do situate equity concerns, equity considerations, they apply equally to any form of education that you want to take, right? So uh, distance education will have to address questions of equity, right? Questions of ensuring that knowledge becomes um, uh, reflective of the different experiences that we have, the different histories, uh, to account for the diversities that we have in our communities in that regard, right? So, so I think to me, the recon when it, there's anything about reconciling, right? I think we need to make social justice education about human liberation. Uh, it cannot just be simply about equity, diversity, and inclusion. It has to be about human liberation. It also has to have the power to name, right? We need to name. And this is why I'm very, very big on questions of race, white supremacy, right? These things are normally not named because there's a very liberal take on social justice, right? That, that sweeps these issues under the carpet. And I think we have to talk about privilege, white supremacy and, 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 and that, right? The most important conversations that we can have today are critical race dialogue. I believe strongly in that. If we look at what is happening globally around it. It doesn't mean that issues about two spirit like GBTQ are not important, gender, class. No, they are, right? Uh, but I think it's very, very important because there, there are issues we don't want to name, we don't want to talk about. And, and, uh, and finally, um, on the, um, the approaches, the synchronous and not synchronous. I, I mean, I've always had trouble making the distinctions, right? I think to me, whatever it is, right? I, I think one size fits all, that's not work. And we need to look at how we put, if we're going to talk about online, how do we have different models, right? Mm -hmm. That take into account the diversity of our learners, that it's not one size fits all. And, 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 that, and I think that's what I'll respond to these issues. Thank you very much, George. Um, Awad, you, you feel free to comment on whatever, but maybe within quotes, the leftovers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think I think, uh, I, and I uh, I raised this um, question as part of uh, 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 an article in a chapter that I wrote about hip hip hop in particular. Mm -hmm. And what I'm thinking of is the things that uh, over time, over and over again, things that are left or left outside the discussion. And to understand the leftover, we have to keep in mind two things at the same time, and this is attention. The body and the epistemo and the body and the epistemological, so epistemology and the body. Um, and if we think about those two, then we have a way to think about the leftover. The leftover, as in, as George just mentioned, uh, schools are um, 
created, framed, um, uh, almost feeling comfortable with certain bodies. Um, and again, with, the, with those bodies comes, comes uh, those bodies come epistemologies. And if we think about those, those two, then the leftover are the bodies that are not, they, they are made not feel comfortable at the school. Epistemology that are made not feel comfortable at the school. And they are made not feel comfortable precisely because over and over again, they are considered either not important or uh, uh, a kind of an add-on or, or, or some form of that. Um, so this is the leftover. And I, I right. really and this, oh, well, this is why, sorry to interrupt. This is, oh. this is why in the beginning, in the very introduction, I, I said that we do not see social justice as a frill, but mm -hmm. as George said, it is at the core of basic education. And this is exactly what you are saying. That's why principle number two of the social justice is basic education. And when I go back to language, and I'm literally meaning yes. the ability to read and write in such a way that people would sit down and exactly. hear you. Exactly. That, I'm talking about right. that is. Yes. Um, so having those tools, having those epistemologies, mm -hmm. having those frameworks that would enable people to speak their uh, their own, their own uh, to tell their own stories, to spell their own names, and so on and so forth, is is uh, a social justice. And ultimately, linking both the question of uh, social justice and, and distance education, as well as the synchronous and asynchronous uh, education, is uh, can also be framed around this idea of the leftover. What are we including and what are we excluding mm -hmm. in the whether it is synchronously or asynchronously, right? And are we thinking about the core? But but, but not only that, George, John. I'm I'm pushing that a little bit further. Why are we including what we including? Of course, yeah. And thinking, and, and even further than what I just asked, is thinking of those choices as choices, mm -hmm. not just as uh, as Carmel mentioned. Is um, uh, how how do you deal with those policies and how do you include them as part of the uh, an organic part of what you do in your everyday in in, in teaching? Yes, yes. Um, and and always, always always thinking about that question of why am I including this and why am I excluding? This? And, and 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 this is why I come back to this idea of the leftover. Uh, uh, if we frame it around the leftover, then there is a way to think about always constantly asking yourself, what am I leaving out? Of course, of course, exactly. And, and um, you, you got cut off a bit, Awad, but one other point I think that I connect, and then I'm going to move immediately to Carmel, is um, people keep on saying, but how many things are we going to do? We don't have time. And my reply is usually, it's not a matter of adding on, but it is a matter of doing things differently. And this is what you are, I think, um, very clearly uh, identifying here, okay? All right, Carmel, there are yes, more uh, questions here. Um, but but I want to focus you... on the uh, very practical question of asynchronicity. Yes, and please, please practices, do. Because that is a very important question as far as I am concerned. I want to validate, first of all, George's uh, claim that there's nothing monolithic. Uh, like anything else, uh, online uh, learning is a space, an educational space. And like any other educational space, it is a contested space. It is a contested terrain. So online learning can domesticate, can oppress, mm -hmm. as it can liberate and emancipate it. And, emancipate. and that's the struggle. Of course. Uh, the thinking right now, how exactly. to transform, you know, these spaces into uh, genuine and authentic, transformative, liberatory, emancipatory, you know, uh, uh, spaces. Now, from a practical point of view, because I see a lot of practicality in this question, um, uh, obviously, to create such spaces, two qualities which are important is trust, security, without mm -hmm. trust. 
and without security, you, not you cannot create a, a genuine communal space because mm -hmm. the context for transformation, you have to create uh, this space. Now with asynchronicity, with asynchronous you know, uh, approaches, it is much more difficult to create uh, such space. Now, uh, if you look at you know, um, what is on offer in terms of online learning, um, uh, I cannot give percentages. I'm not going to be, going to be uh, quantitative in my approach, but a large majority would be uh, vocational uh, in nature. So basically in between uh, life, family life, in between you know, work, there is continuous professional development and online learning generally fits in this vocational you know, notion uh, of education. So we need to also to interrogate exactly what content uh, is being produced and how this content and knowledge is being produced. Because obviously I did start analyzing how knowledge uh, is created. And uh, despite the fact that people are pushing this idea of autonomous learning and independent learning, there's a lot of it which is still right. transmission in nature as far as pedagogy is concerned. So we're making learning perhaps much more sexier and much more available, but pedagogically, pedagogically, uh, we are fixed in the transmission approach. And what's even worse is that some of these contents come in ready-made, pre-prepared -pre 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 commercially and peddled by educators who are precariously uh, paid to do so. So that is the context which is uh, coming out of my uh, uh, research. So yes, I do believe that we need more time than simply an asynchronous learning to create a safe space, a secure space, a trustworthy space where basically uh, people can then engage, okay, critically with the world. Uh, engage critically with the word and generating the things. And for that to happen, you cannot go exclusively, entirely, or and predominantly uh, asynchronous. Thank you very much, Carmel. Um, listen, there are other questions going on. Um, these are available to the panelists and to the attendees. Uh, it is 6.27, we have three minutes left. It is impossible to deal with all these questions. So it is not a matter of not wanting um, to, to deal with these questions. One brief comment from me and a thank you note, and then I'll hand over to Alex to conclude, okay? So um, it is very clear to me that um, while we, we are critiquing online or, or certain forms of online, um, we can take this opportunity of COVID and the increase online to reconsider some very radical, that is root questions about the very nature of education and social justice. This is still a very relevant issue, okay? So that's one point. Secondly, I hope, I really hope that the COVID uh, scare and push will honestly make educators, including us in higher education, rethink how we teach and why we teach. And Carmel's last point is, is exactly this. I mean, people, some colleagues say, oh, it is very easy online. I just keep on doing what I was doing. But, but the question is, what on earth have you been doing? What on earth have I been doing? And this becomes, it is still a very crucial question. The third point of the democratization is crucial and 3CL is attempting hopefully practically, as you can see through these sessions, to actually bring to reality the more democratization of doing things on online. I thank George, I thank Awad, I thank Carmel, I thank 3CL and um, Cole, but also very much Gabriela Casola, who has been very hard working um, uh, behind the scenes. Thank you. Thank you also to the attendees. Alex, the last word is yours. Yeah, 60 seconds. Thank you very much. I and mean, we've been trying to set this uh, set of workshops for a long time, as John knows. I've been chasing him for a long time. John. So I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that, that he, you know, 
he managed to come in such an excellent panel of speakers and I've, I've been really interested in hearing you and in between all of this just to put the whole um, comedy of online uh, to you all I actually lost my zoom connection at one stage because I had an internet outage so there I was half listening to what you know Professor George Day was, was, was saying at some stage everything went uh, so this whole I think about being disenfranchised sometimes you can feel it on your skin but at the same time I would also put a little you know <laughs> Machiavellian thing spanner in the works so we didn't have zoom during Covid days um, Yes, we did go into the emergency teaching. We did not really do online teaching. And I think that's something that we should be yeah. looking yeah. at, I think, in, in, in what's to come. The last thing was a plug for what we actually did. Okay, And, and John was very much involved in this. Uh, we've just published a book. It's about to be published on the 8th, 8th of July on um, media technology and education in a post-truth society. That's also what the TreeCL is trying to do. We started with like, <laughs> an activist workshop, COVID hit us, we publish a book, but we're already planning as to, you know, go back to the basics of getting people to talk to discuss and actually get things done. Um, so I would encourage all of you who are listening and the panelists to actually join us um, because we all, this is a process of co-learning. Thank you very much. I think it's been a really excellent session. Alex, Alex, a quick advert. On Wednesday, we have a second in the series and it will be on education and leadership and social justice. Thanks very much, John. Thank, Thank you, all. you all, wherever you are. Take care, all of you. Okay, bye stay bye. safe. Bye-bye.